Welcome to another episode of Working with Gen Z. Friends, there's an old poem by Rudyard Kipling that says, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. But anyone who is in the business world, in the professional world, will agree that companies today, people today are so interconnected and interdependent that we have to work with colleagues around the world. And it doesn't matter if it's a small company or large company. Now, whether it's in a company like iPhone manufacturing in India, whether it's uh, the rest of the world trying to look at German expertise for their cars or whatever it is, we have to deal with companies and colleagues uh, who have certain expertise. And therefore, it, it, the corollary to that is that when you deal with um, colleagues from other part of the world, right, um, there is a certain nuance or a cultural aspect in terms of not just getting to know them, but how do you actually uh, become proficient at it? Because this is not something where you say that I do it one time and that's it, right? The world is increasingly, increasingly so interconnected that that's a, a, a fundamental skill almost expected from all managers around the world. And to help us with that, to understand the various nuances, to decode some of the myths and myths, uh, myths around the world of uh, intercultural, multicultural, culturalism, and all the different <laughs> words that are going to use in, in that domain is our expert, uh, Robert Gibson. Because a lot of times, um, people have this notion that if I travel outside, I think I'm culturally very savvy. But I think we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll try and peel some of that uh, to, to figure out that what do we actually mean by a cultural expert. And to help me with that is my guest, uh, Robert Getson. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so Robert, um, just as we do with every um, guest, uh, I'm going to briefly read uh, your uh, um, bio or a profile, and you asked me kindly to keep it brief. So friends, uh, uh, to give uh, a quick snap of what um, uh, rich background that Robert brings us, Robert has 30 years of experience of global competence development in business and education. He was responsible for intercultural training for the multinational engineering corporation Siemens for more than 18 years and has been an adjunct faculty at the Bologna School Business School since 2012, teaching the global MBA program. His latest book, Bridge the Culture Gap, a toolkit for effective collaboration in the diverse global workplace published by NB Hatchet in 2021. He lives in Munich, Germany. So Robert, welcome once again, and thank you for uh, taking time to help us with this episode. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm very pleased to talk to you. So Robert, uh, um, before I dive in, I have um, a whole lot of questions on the topic, but uh, I, I'd like for you to share anything more, um, perhaps on your background or the work that you do uh, for our viewers. I know that you very kindly asked me to keep the profile very uh, brief, but anything else would you like to share or uh, that you wanted, um, you know, let us know uh, in terms of your work, your background, etc. Okay, I think the uh, the key thing about my background is that um, I'm involved with culture from a couple of different angles. So one thing is I, I was born in the UK, but I've lived in Germany for over 30 years. So I've experienced uh, within Europe uh, uh, cultural differences. Uh, but also something that I think is equally important, actually maybe even more important, is the fact that I've moved between the world of um, universities and the world of business. Uh, I found those are actually also two a bit different cultures. So I really enjoy that doing working with business clients or working, for instance, at the, uh, as you mentioned, at the Bologna Business School. Sure. Excellent. So uh, lovely, um, Robert. Let's let's begin. I'm going to dive straight into our question now. I want to start with something very um, simple, basic, just to to help our viewers with the the um, in the basic fundamentals are just kind of the con concept, yeah. the definition. So maybe you, we can start by you um, helping us to understand, you know, the word culture. Because and when I say the word culture, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, people often interchangeably use terms like interculture, cross-culture, multicultural, transculture. So what, what is the distinction there? I think it's that's important actually to know what we're talking about because when I'm using culture, I'm not really talking just about music and art and, and those things, sort of high culture. I'm talking about uh, what I would call a shared system of attitudes, values, beliefs, meanings, and behavior. Shared system of attitudes, values, beliefs, meanings, and behavior. So this is can belong to any group, actually. It's not just a national cultural group. It can be any group of people. It's the unique thing about it is it's something which people share. You can call it the mindset or 
um, Gerd Hofstede, one of the um, pioneers of intercultural research, he uses the word software of the mind. Um, mm. Maybe that's a little bit too mechanical. He was an engineer, so he liked those <laughs> sorts of words. Um, or I like a definition by the Canadian interculturalist Nancy Adler. She talks about culture is what most people do most of the time. Uh, so it's about groups, and mm. uh, that's important. The second part of your question really about these terms, the, as you say, there are a lot of terms around, and they're, they're all fairly close to each other, and to some extent interchangeable. Sure. But I think there are some distinctions. I mean, we talk about multicultural society. That really is referring to the fact that different cultural groups, different ethnic groups, for instance, exist in, in a society like in India or like where I come from in, in London. Um, if you start talking about cross-culture, then you're really thinking of comparing cultures. So you're saying, okay, uh, let's have a look at these two or more cultures and compare them. The next one, intercultural, is really stressing, and that's the word I use most because I, I find it the most practical. Um, and that's a word um, which really describes the interaction between the cultures. So cultures coming together, what you described at the beginning, East uh, meets West or whatever. And this is a relatively new term that you also mentioned, transculture. And that's actually, I think, a very interesting development. That's where people are saying we need to go beyond culture and focus actually not so much on difference, but on commonalities. What do we have in common? Uh, because actually finding commonalities, although being aware of the difference, that's the secret actually to mm -hmm. successful prints of business uh, across borders. Right. Well, excellent. No, I think this is very helpful just to really understand kind of the, the basic definitions and, and why, like you say, they're interchangeable. There is a there is a kind of a distinct difference in in, yeah. in some of these attempts. So thank you for that. I think that uh, that lays the foundation. Uh, let me begin, Robert. Since our focus is on the Generation Z, as as uh, the focus of our um, podcast, and obviously, as you know, that when we talk about this generation, this is you know a group of um, uh, you know folks who will just be entering the workforce, right? So the, the eldest of the Generation Z is about 25, 26, depending on you know when you look at the starting age of that uh, of that generation, which means that uh, they're just beginning their professional career. Now, um, as we said, uh, it, irrespective of where you're based, uh, whether you are a, a, a mid-sized company or a region company, um, there is a very good chance that you know your company at some point or perhaps in your professional career, you will likely to deal with a colleague in London or somewhere in the West or in Singapore or Australia or somewhere in India, right? And so uh, it's one thing for people to say that, yeah, I, I've met and I've spoken to someone, but how do we actually, when you think from the Gen Z's perspective, how do we build um, more mature skills, right, uh, uh, of what we call cross-culture um, skills? So, so if I'm a Gen Z entering the professional workforce, right, what are the ways in which companies can help um, build a set of these skills, right? I don't even know if, if I can call them skills, but maybe just the competency over a career. Um, and, and, you know, yeah. What approach, what have you seen? Yeah, I, th I think that's um, what you said at the beginning really resonated with me about it's not enough just to travel, for instance. I think a lot of people that I met in my work inside a corporation, which was a very international organization, we were in 190 countries I had when I was there a large number of people, 450,000 people in 190 countries. And I was traveling around a lot. And there's this sort of business traveler thing where people go around and and they think actually, oh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, super intercultural because I've traveled to all these places. I mean, at the high point, I was going to three different continents in a week, you know, and I didn't, I didn't actually know where I was really. I, you know, one time I went to Sao Paulo and then, then uh, back to Munich and then to Hong Kong. And, I was completely uh, jet lagged. It was sort of exciting, but it was crazy. And I wouldn't pretend that I know about Brazil or um, or China from those, those that experience. Yeah. But I think that people sometimes make that mistake of equating that. Of course, this experience is really valuable, but it's really a question of what you do with that experience. And that's where I think uh, it's very important to uh, connect that with learning. And this is what many companies do to create ways of learning through formal training and education. And I would hope that a, um, somebody of that generation, you would look for a company perhaps which is offering you learning opportunities. Uh, and the learning can be, doesn't have to be formal training. It can also be like mentoring. You can work together 
with somebody, uh, for instance, from a different generation. I mean, I found that great before I left uh, the company that I was working for. The last two years, I wanted to make a handover of my topic, which was intercultural training, mm -hmm. to a younger colleague. And we were, my boss, I think it was very good. He put us together. And um, I found it very, very interesting also for me. And she said she appreciated it. She came with a lot of no, new ideas. And I came with my experience. And um, so this sort of uh, peer, learning from your peers, learning on the job is very important. The other thing which is really very central in my book, which really in a way trains this, and I would call it a skill, is um, training yourself to reflect on those experiences and reflect mm -hmm. on your own reaction. So what I use in the book is an approach I call the OAR approach, which is O-A-R. So I say to people, First of all, you need to really focus on your observation skills. So when you're dealing with people who are different from yourself, either from different countries or just different in generation or different region or um, just different from you or different gender, um, try to observe how things are, observe what's happening before you start coming to some conclusion. Because often we're actually triggered by people's behavior and it sets off some emotions perhaps. And then we react and we evaluate and say, oh, that person was rude. That's what they, often people say about Germans. They say, oh, they're rude. Well, they might be rude to you, but actually they would consider it to be honest and direct. Mm -hmm. uh, and my British uh, friends always uh, are very polite and they think that's good to be polite, but the Germans say, we never know what they think. <laughs> and um, this is an issue that many have with India. Uh, Germans that say the Indians always say yes, and then nothing happens, you know. And they, <laughs> this is, uh, and they nod their head in a strange way, and we're not sure what's going on. So observe first of all. Second one A is for analyze. Then you can start thinking about well, what's behind this? Is it a difference in communication style, or is it something to do with this individual? Maybe they are a difficult individual. Maybe they are rude. But is it something deeper than that? And maybe it's something to do with the fact that actually, in, in, for instance, in Germany, um, often people are quite direct in their communication. Uh, not all the time, but, but that's a tendency. Um, and the last stage is to really reflect and recommend. So reflecting on this thinking, okay, how did that affect me? And recommending either to yourself or to other people, what can we do about that? And so if, if for instance, the German finds the British too polite, I train them to say, to ask some questions. Well, what do you mean by that when you say my talk was interesting? And what was interesting about it? <laughs> and then they find out if it really was interesting or if it was just a polite phrase. Or if the Indian says yes, then to ask them, <laughs> well, when will you deliver it? Or tell me what you're going to be doing next week. And they go, oh, I'm on holiday. Well, then, you know, they're not going to be doing it. And yes doesn't mean yes. Yeah. yeah. So I hope I don't, don't want to stereotype Indians, but that's just no, something I've heard so often from my, um, from my German uh, colleagues. So I think it's those three things, experience. So try to get into as many contact with many people who are different from yourself as you can. Go to lunch with people who basically you think well, at first sight, there's someone who's completely alien to me. Go do it and, and have, a, have, a, have a tea or a coffee or something with them. And then use learning opportunities uh, and also then take the time out to reflect. And unfortunately, the last phase is what people often neglect because they're very busy and they just keep going. But I, um, I think that's a very valuable thing. And as I say, I give some tips for that in the book about how you can do that. And there are exercises to practice that. It's a bit like um, um, actually sport. You know, it's not, as you said at the beginning, it's not a one-off thing. You're, yeah. You say, okay, today I want to run the marathon and uh, I go to the fitness studio and do half an hour uh, on the treadmill. That's not going to make me run the yeah. marathon. I need to train over a very long time uh, to do that. And intercultural competence development is a lifetime uh, thing. The last point I want to make is actually about companies. Companies now are doing um, um, are doing something quite interesting. They're, I think they're, it's been accelerated by the pandemic, but it was happening before that. And that's um, what they call it learning ecosystems. They're, so they're setting up structures for learning. And this can be web-based, of course. Um, so at Siemens, we had something called the learning world where we had different topics and we put all the resources for that topic onto a platform. So the resources could be training modules, could be videos, could be um, articles, could be interviews with people, could be best practice. Uh, but it can also be just a list of names of people you could contact uh, to get a, um, some aspiring partner to, to talk to inside the company 
or it could be if you want to book a training program or a, a formal coaching or something. But a lot of it was happening outside of that um, formal training situation. Sure. No, excellent. I think you mentioned many things there, right from the ability to sort of just gain firsthand experience, then to speaking to colleagues internally, doing a mutual mentoring, which yeah. can be very, very effective. But I really like uh, the uh, the simple framework of the OER, observe, analyze, yeah. like that. And even observing, I think oftentimes we just uh, undermine that. Like, can we carefully observe without you know judging into something to say that? Hey, uh, absolutely. Like you, I mean, I, I recently posted something on LinkedIn, a picture of a restaurant in London, uh, a Chinese restaurant in London. Uh -huh. And I, I just wanted to say I'd been to London and we'd had this, and I was amazed to find this Chinese restaurant. But I got thousands of... Uh, of people <laughs> looked at this and lots of people commented and said oh yeah they serve those terrible chicken wings and, <laughs> and i wrote back and said these are not chicken wings there there's no chicken there at all and yeah. this person was really angry said, but i'm sure they're chicken wings I thought, well i i was there i ate them you know yeah. she was seen because she was used to something that was fried and a certain size looked like chicken wings yeah. but there was no way these were chicken wings yeah. and uh, and it's we see what we want to see and as we know, and this is something I also think is very interesting, we we have a cultural filter in our brain, what we mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. So um, we're brought up to see certain things, and then we tend to evaluate it. So if you've had a, um, a school teacher who wore a particular type of glasses, horn rimmed glasses or something, and then you see somebody applying for a job and you're the manager, you might say, and you didn't like this teacher, then you may, without really knowing it, be a bit biased against this person, and it, yeah. it's misleading you. So the brain is filtering things all the time because it can't cope with all the impressions that we get all the time um, and it's using the cultural background that we have what we experience in our group in our life which is unique to us of course uh, to filter that and so we we see and and I'm sure you know you know when people you ask people they see an accident and everybody sees a different perspective of that yeah. accident you know? yeah. uh, depending on where they were standing when the two cars crashed together uh, they will report on different things so it's being aware of your own, uh, wiring actually, and how 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 are you wired, and what are my things? And I find my I, I'm not uh, exempt from this. You know, I find myself doing that all the time and uh, misinterpreting situations. So take time for this observation phase. No, I like it because uh, and uh, as is an excellent example because um, we just uh, you know I think we tend to jump to conclusion quickly and and like you said it's it's like building a muscle it, it you know you have to train yourself it's it's the confirmation bias rather I would say <laughs> where we yeah. you know kind of uh, look for what we think uh, what we want to see now Robert you obviously travel so extensively around the world and do you uh, and you mentioned about the learning ecosystem are there any companies I mean just generally whatever that you feel can share uh, who are um, who are um, uh, very good about kind of you know building this kind of cultural quotient into their system. I know that a lot of um, multinational, like we had a client for more, more than ten years, and they're one of the top you know sort of the top thirty companies, Dow companies in the U.S. And they they had a huge center in India. Now we used to do a program where we used to get people from twenty twenty five countries now, and in the classic uh, way, we had about five or six people. Uh, on a table and then everybody would start talking into their own language till the time the, the global CEO was once kind of there as a guest and he said look we can never be a global company if you don't have the courtesy to respect the person next to you and be mindful that look uh, you know there's someone else on the table who doesn't understand what you're saying and it's rude to them and it's not a good thing so if you really want to call yourself and become a global manager like start doing these small things right so I'm wondering, any any companies that you feel like are really like uh, you know, uh, we obviously heard in companies like Unilever and and so on, but but any other companies that come to mind like we've done a good job? Um, I think that um, I mean I, I come across quite a few of those companies in in Germany. It's not saying sure. that Germany is better, but Germany yeah. is very heavily dependent on exports, and so I think people have um, and I also and I think in Germany a lot of people are actually quite curious about foreign cultures when I go to see um, friends uh, German friends they I notice they always have quite a lot of travel books they like to travel and <laughs> they go uh, all over the world and I think in business I think this export thing has driven people to realize they need to do it so I I, um, I mean obviously I, I at Siemens where I was um, uh, we had a whole department um, for this topic you know and we were 
Um, that, that was my job to coordinate that. So that did exist within the company. And I know that um, other companies um, also do that. The, 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 um, the car manufacturers that you mentioned earlier in Germany, of course, like Audi and BMW, they take the topic also very, very seriously. So um, I wouldn't pretend to have an overview of that, but I think that's something that maybe if you if your audience if they have an interview, yeah, um, I would I would suggest they maybe ask about that sort sure. of thing and say, yeah. um, what do you do to foster diversity, to foster yeah. uh, intercultural competence? And if they are sort of blank or don't really reply, then you you should be a little bit suspicious. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, as I said before, it doesn't have to mean that they've got a, a training program. You go on three day seminars, but they've just got some idea of how they deal with that or a policy uh, that they have. For instance, like with that language thing, you describe something which I've experienced many times because yeah. I, I facilitated many meetings, international meetings. And I found, okay, the meeting was in English, but then when we had the dinner, um, mm -hmm. people would all sit together. So the all the all the Germans were in one corner, all the Chinese were in one corner and um, actually, I always I ended up then trying to structure that. So I actually gave people a place setting and said, "You don't you sit not with the people you know." I mean, it's a little bit mean because actually, when you're tired at the end of the day and you're speaking English as a foreign language, which was the case for many of the people, um, then uh, you want to have a bit of a break from that. It's quite stressful, yeah. but I think that's really important. Um, yeah. And in terms of language thing, which you mentioned. I think it's also very important that the native speakers learn how to speak clear English. So I did some work also with them because often um, I found that the native speakers of English um, were not understood sometimes by the, by the people who had English as a second or third language. And um, often they were talking too quickly, particularly, I must say, embarrassing my, my colleagues from UK, where they had no real feeling for, for language. Mm. And in India, you're sort of lucky because... I'm always amazed by, uh, I remember doing an Indian-German workshop and the the German says, oh, um, why do we do have everything in uh, in English? Why can't the Indians learn German? And I, <laughs> I looked at an Indian colleague and I said, uh, can you just tell me how many languages you speak? And he, <laughs> he said, well, actually only about five or something, you know, and uh, he listed these languages that he spoke to various members of the family, to his... I said, okay. And then I said to the German, how many languages do you speak? Uh, uh, and yeah. so I think this language issue is, is an issue too. That's one side of this. But if a company is really inclusive and is diverse, they, they really need to have some approach to this and, and to, to, to help it because it doesn't happen automatically. It's got to be part of the policy. And uh, so I wouldn't want to name any further sure. companies. I think most internationally successful companies are doing this in some way. Yeah. Now, what can be the, uh, the on the other side, Robert, what can be some of the, I mean, we, I mean, we, you know, you obviously have been teaching uh, in, in uh, you know, experience MBA programs, and obviously there are people who come from all parts of the world, but despite the fact when we say the world is connected and interdependent and all of that, right, there, there there's probably a huge scope for companies to become better. So are there some mistakes that companies make in other words like just you know, push someone at the deep end of the pool or just you know hey here's a young engineer and you know we want you to travel to thailand or uh what what are some of the things that companies shouldn't do in other words what are the basic mistakes that could happen like no training or or what have you seen like are there things that that you have seen yeah i mean one thing that that um i feel is that with this topic there is a tendency with some people to do one of two things, either to underestimate the mm. uh, role of culture. So they say, oh, we're, we're really global. We've been global for 100 years and um, um, we sell things all over the world and we travel a lot, like we mentioned before. So we don't need anything. You know, we don't need any help. Um, that's one tendency. Yeah. And then another tendency, which is quite interesting, is when people have discovered the culture thing, they start reading a few books and uh, then they think, Everything has to do with culture. And so, oh my goodness. I, and then they get paralyzed, actually. Um, uh, we had an issue actually with people, Germans going to Saudi Arabia, where mm. the HR department phoned me up and they said in, in, in Saudi Arabia and said, can you stop doing this intercultural training? Because the people are so frightened of making a mistake 
that they then are, are, are inactive. You know, they're just sitting there worried that they're going to do something wrong. Yeah. So this, this two, the two extremes, because it's not everything is explained by culture, but culture, as somebody said to me, is like salt in the soup. You can taste it, but you can't take it out. You can't isolate it. You don't know what is culture and what's not culture, what it has to do with just business and things. So I would say getting a healthy attitude to the role of culture, not over or underestimating it. I think on the individual level, I think some people are uh, a danger is that some people are very attracted to stereotypes. So if they discover the topic, they say, now, now, I want a list of do's and don'ts for for China or whatever. And that's that's dangerous because those do's and don'ts can never reflect the complexity of the situation. Um, and the, the other thing on the company or organizational level, I think, is that still people are underestimating the role of culture in in the organizational development, um, or when they do a change program worldwide, or when they do a merge or acquisition, um, often people are very focused on the hard facts, on the financials, on uh, getting things going. And I appreciate that they're under a lot of pressure to get the deal done, but they don't actually think about then the cultural mix of these um, of the company, perhaps that they're acquiring, or the process that they're trying to introduce in a different place. So. I would say it basically comes down to um, taking culture seriously and um, not trying to oversimplify things with um, uh, by, get, by by drifting into the into the stereotypes because that's counterproductive. Yeah, no, I really like, and that's an excellent point. I've seen, I'm sure, um, where um, you know when large companies or when multiple they go in organic and buy a company and there's clash of this. You know a very high hierarchical culture with versus a very friendly culture yep. in one part of the world or one part of the yep. company uh so I mean, i'm thinking just from now in hr lens that are there i know for instance like personalities we will have some instruments to find are there something in the domain of culture as well where maybe if as like you said if, if a company is serious and they really believe in you know i'm I was reading a book where they were giving examples of companies like Procter and Gamble and Unilever and and GE and some of these other companies who, who do a very good job of talent succession. They they actually plan and say that look, if you wish to grow in our firm, you will have to move out of you know from from A location to B and then you know get a global experience. So is there a way for companies? I mean, are there tools or instruments that which can kind of give them? A scorecard, if you will, that just says that, hey, listen. No, no. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that that's an important thing because um, obviously companies need to measure things and, and manage things. Yeah. And mm -hmm. at, at Siemens, we had a, a when I was there, we had a competency framework which where they identified the key competencies for leaders. And yeah. uh, I was very pleased when they included they called it intercultural sensitivity. That was one of those, and they they okay. defined levels of intercultural sensitivity, and that was something which then was was in the whole development of the uh, it was it was involved with the recruitment of people and then it was involved in the development process so when i had my uh, performance management meeting with my boss he had to give me like a grade for for this um, for this topic um, alongside other things like oh, okay. decision making or whatever um there are some uh, and uh, there are um, I, I list some in my book and explain them a little bit more than i can do now Sure. There are there are some tools out there which some people find helpful. Um, one um, developed by somebody called Milton Bennett some years ago, which I think is quite good, is called the International Development Inventory (IDI), and um, and that looks at people and tries to identify what stage of intercultural development they're at. Um, because I would see basically five stages of being interculturally competent as you said at the beginning and we repeated it's not like riding a bicycle yeah. you can do it but you can't do it it's something which you can have degrees of so i think the first um, stage in intercultural development is accepting culture yeah but accepting there are differences not saying everybody is the same um, then somehow understanding them sort of saying okay i now know why this is the case then to move towards adapting so dealing with this maybe you need to switch codes when you're talking to people or you have to change your behavior, then actually uh, effectively functioning in the culture. And the, the fifth stage is what I call uh, bridging culture. So you're like mediating between cultures. So you can define then behaviors, uh, which uh, this IDI, for instance, does, which are linked to these various stages and say, okay, 
and you get people to talk about their encounters. And if they say, no, I think everybody's the same and we're a global company, then you realize they're in a very low level of this intercultural competence. There are some other tools as well, which go a bit deeper. One is called the Cultural Orientations Indicator. Um, I've I, yeah, I've used that with um, with various companies. Actually, I'm trained to, to use that as a particular tool. And, um, and there's another one which I really like called the Intercultural Readiness Check. I think I would uh, you can you can find these online. Well, as I say, I mentioned them in in, in my book, and you and you can find the one that suits you. There's not one size that fits all. Um, and I would be a bit careful with them because they they're not magic. You know, uh, I think the most important thing with your um, is to get into some dialogue with people about uh, where they talk about their experiences, and then you see where their development is. But the the tool can be an the, these tools can be an indicator, and they I think the field is becoming much more scientific now than it was when I got started in, in twenty years ago. Yeah, excellent. No, I really like um, you mentioned three specific ones, but the idea again is 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 to use them as 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 uh, you know some kind of a benchmark if you will uh, just just to say that hey listen I you know maybe if I'm a six I I, I think I can go and become an eight or uh, and, and maybe the two the instrument gives us that feedback right and and so uh, I think that's what, what I, yeah what I yeah, actually sure. meant is is really to use them as a basis for discussion so sure this, for instance this cultural orientations indicator which I'm most familiar with because yeah. I got trained to use it. I was asked to um, to coach some people in in a very large um, logistics company worldwide, uh, and they although they were active worldwide, they they didn't feel that the people had such an uh, international mindset, you know. And so they said we want to coach these. These were key uh, people in the management, um, and um, so we got them to do this uh, online test. And that was I got the results, and then then they had like a one hour coaching session with me and I found that very useful the useful thing was not just the results it was the discussion which was based on that so you've got some basis and and you'd say well I I was interested why you um, you know maybe didn't do so well at this part of this test and and you did very well at this part and and then you you build on that and then that increases the awareness of people so I would say these these instruments should be used in connection with um, coaching with training with dialogue Yeah, excellent. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, it's a good basis for conversation. And, and uh, but now let me just to extend that thought, um, Robert. Um, if you're, uh, you know, as you said in the beginning, that you know, look, it's a process. It's a journey of sorts. And uh, for many of us, right, uh, uh, you know, perhaps there comes a stage in our career that uh, where maybe I've made a few trips to, you know, in Asia, for instance. You know, I. And then I've learned a little more about uh, the Asian culture, even though I may be based in Asia. And uh, so you you move up this trajectory or you move up this ladder, but at some point you're actually leading a multicultural team, right? And maybe you haven't undergone an instrument or whatever, or a formal training, right? What are some of the do's and don'ts? And I look at my own experience, like I was leading a team where we had about 15 people, half the team was in Singapore, but even from that team there, and we had girl, one girl from Finland. We had someone from uh, France. We had someone from the UK, and uh, two people from China. And even in within India, we had people from different parts. So again, there was a lot of learning for me, uh, almost. And I think much of that came when I was speaking one on one and so on. But oftentimes, mm-hmm. in a in a large setting, uh, uh, you know, it was almost like, okay, what do I say, which which kind of lands for everybody? So any general tips of some of the do's and don'ts, like. Or someone who's going to now lead a multicultural team. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's a, that's something which um, very much interests me because I think that's that's a particular skill, and yeah. I also had that privilege to have a multicultural team. And uh, I realized when I had my team, um, it was a question of taking a bit of time to recognize the um, the cultures of the team, so where people were coming from. Of course, some of it's individual personality. But some of it's influenced by culture and saying, well, what are the strengths of these people? So I remember quite well when I was trying to get my international team to produce a presentation and they were going to have to present at the employee meeting with uh, several hundred people and uh, where they had to present our strategy for our department to everybody else and uh, quite a critical audience and so forth. And I remember uh, the first meeting, I thought this this could be chaotic. You know, everybody's talking at cross purposes, saying that we're not saying anything at all. And I I thought, 
this, uh, maybe as well just do it myself, you know? And uh, But then I realized, I thought, no, I don't want to do it myself and I shouldn't do it myself. And I'm supposed to be an interculturalist, so I should be able to handle this, you know? So I, I realized that the, uh, actually one of the German colleagues, she was very good at, she was more sort of quiet person. She was very good at doing the research. So I got her doing, you know, finding the documents and, and doing the sort of back office stuff. And there was, um, uh, there was somebody else, an uh, American guy, actually, he was uh, very good at presenting. Everybody found him very, uh, very powerful. He, he was excellent with an international audience, but but he wasn't sort of a details person. You know, he he, he just uh, uh, was very vague when he talked. So I thought, okay, he's going to be our presenter. Um, and then I thought, well, what's my role? And there was other people, of course. And I thought, well, my role, I don't want to, uh, my role maybe is just to coordinate this, you know, to be in the background, although I was the, the leader of the team. There's a very um, interesting list, I think, which comes from a, uh, another book, which is by, has been around for a long time, a guy called Terence Brake. Uh, Terence Brake uh, wrote a book called Where in the World is My Team? And he he calls them the six C's of um, global virtual collaboration or running like a multicultural team, particularly in a virtual setting, which many people are doing. Uh, many, of, many of you are doing, those people are listening to this, I'm sure you're working in in, in virtual teams. And so the six C's, are, the first one is cooperation, which is um, basically building trust uh, with people. And you need to, and people, trust is based on different things in different places. You know how to, have to know how to build trust. Is trust coming from people seeing you as competent, as a manager or leader, or is it based on uh, charisma or whatever? So you need to, anyway, but you need this trust. Um, you need what he calls convergence. This is, means you need to make it clear what the what the common goal is. And I found that actually even very disparate teams, if they've got a very clear goal, um, they will they will get there. You know, um, we wanted to do training at one time for uh, Bayern Munich for the football team because we said they must need intercultural training. They've got so many people, players from all over the world, but they don't actually because they're so focused on winning the match and they're so focused on their football, they don't actually... Uh, maybe necessarily need that, although they, they probably get that. So having a clear purpose as convergence. Next one is, is coordination. That's really making sure everybody's working in the same way, using the same tools and processes. Uh, capability using those skills, that I, like I mentioned in my team, so recognizing what's in those people. Uh, finding a way of communicating, that, so that's the, uh, the fifth C. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, deciding how you're going to communicate, because people will have different preferences. Some people might prefer an email. Some people prefer a call. Some people prefer a text message. Some people prefer some uh, shared uh, site where you've got all the documents or whatever. Um, so you need to really work out how you're going to do that and agree on it. It will be different for every every team. There's no unique. Uh, every team is unique, and there will be no universal way of doing this. And the other one is really to try to identify the cultural preferences and and use them for an advantage because. Basically, we know that uh, multicultural teams, if they're well managed and well constituted, they're likely to be more innovative and more uh, closer to customers and actually financially more successful than monocultural teams. If they're not well led, by the way, this is, then they lose value and you just spend a lot of time uh, talking across purposes and not getting anything done. But they, if you want to be innovative, which is so important um, these days particularly, uh, in many areas, then you really need different perspectives, and you need someone, and that's the that's the exciting role, I think, of the leader, who's able to bring this together and coordinate that. No, excellent. Yeah, I really like the six C um, example, and that could be uh, kind of a frame that person can use. So, final couple of questions, Robert. Um, one, of course, uh, just as a way to kind of close out, I I want to ask, like, let's say, so given this is for our Gen Z population, what can the Gen Z uh, young manager do or don't as they enter into the workforce? So what advice would you have for them? So we heard, you know, what companies are doing. We heard the mistakes companies can make. We heard how you kind of, you know, become better with time. We heard about the tools and instruments. Uh, how do you lead a team? But if I'm a fresh graduate, right, I'm just entering my sort of the 40 year career that I have ahead of me. Uh, what can I do something before coming into my in the work system? Uh, are there some basic tips? 
Yeah, I mean, before you, before you join a company, or, or yeah. it's, it's worth doing some research into the people and finding out about them, looking at their background, and but not just looking at say, okay, this is a um, this is a an American, so they must be like this, but actually looking at the, at the individual. So um, actually, uh, on a practical level, I when I have an important client meeting, I take a look at their LinkedIn profile or something and see, well, where's this person coming from? What's their background? Um, and so you might want to look at their professional background, their national background, their, their international experience, the jobs that they've done. So you find out, you do a lot of uh, research there. Um, when you're in the company or in an organization, again, this observation skill is very important. So if you, you know, people say to me, well, how am I supposed to dress in the office? Like, well, you, you look around and you see how are those people, what are they wearing? And then you, you can make a statement and wear something different, but you can also say, okay, I shouldn't wear, dress too formally or uh, I, I have to dress more formally, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think um, I, I think it's also very important to be able to ask a lot of questions. And um, mm -hmm. so before you make assumptions, to, to spend a bit of time asking, not telling people, oh, uh, yeah, this is what you're like, but, but just asking very open questions about uh, how things are done. And people will understand that if you're new, um, that you ask questions. And if you want to ask about culture, People are often very, very happy to um, to talk about that, you know. So, I mean, I, I have that all the time when I go to China. I'm going there next week, and um, I, I may have to ask. Well, I have to ask uh, local people, um, what do I bring if I'm invited to somebody's house? What's appropriate? Yeah. I know some things are taboo, and um, you you don't take an umbrella as a present because that means you never want to see the people again or whatever. Um, but it's unique to every situation. Um, and you need to find that. That's where you need another thing. You need to find some I call local informants. So right. in, somebody in the organization who you can trust, who's able to talk to you. And those people are not necessarily super high up in the hierarchy. Right. If you're talking to the big boss or whatever, they may not, there's too much power going on there, to, to be honest. So um, you can get a lot of information maybe from a team assistant, maybe from a fellow, from somebody on an internship or something, um, um, who really knows how that organization ticks and they can help you. And they will tell you the unique things about this organization. You know, what do people do at lunchtime? How do they celebrate somebody's birthday or not or whatever, which you can not get from a book. Um, and um, I would urge people, though, also to not lose their authenticity. Um, you're really valuable for an organization, uh, not because you've got massive experience, which you don't have, yeah. But because you're coming with a fresh mind, and and you can be you can be proud of that actually, and it's very very useful. And don't um, don't be arrogant and say oh, you should do things in this way or something like that on the first day. But you can you can offer your perspectives, and you may well be saying things that the other people would have liked to say, but they've stopped asking these questions. I found that when I joined this big company, um, I was completely confused by all the abbreviations they were using. They had uh, acronyms for everything you know and, and so quite naively i would say at a meeting sorry uh, you use this whatever it was uh what does that what does that mean and then it was amazing because people have been there 10 years they said actually we're not quite sure either you know and, <laughs> I could and uh and that was not it was not a problem so asking those things in a in a open uh curious way but not in a um, not in an arrogant or aggressive way then and then you would alienate people yeah no, excellent. Wow. Very, very good um, suggestions from research to just sort of you know, having the curiosity, having the humility to kind of uh, be yourself. I mean, uh, be authentic, but also being humble enough to kind of learn, right? And I yeah, think that, that's uh, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So final couple of questions, uh, Robert. One, of course, any any final kind of piece of advice as we uh, close out? But I also, second, that's one. Number two, uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the book, the book that you've written and where can people find more oh, okay. information about the book? Uh, because I think you've shared some really good nuggets from from the book itself, which uh, which I, I'd like our viewers to check it out uh, in addition to the, the insights today. Um, okay, so um, thank you very much. The Yeah, I, I always have uh, basically three uh sort of tips, which are very general things, which I think uh, would apply to to this generation, but also to many other people as well. 
I think, and they, they sum up a little bit what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So the first one is really taking culture seriously. That it's, it's a topic that is not, people say, oh, it's a soft skill and all the rest of it, but it really has hard impact. Things can collapse. It's not easy to pin down. It's not easy to measure. Um, and maybe it's immeasurable, but it's certainly something you can feel and it's, uh, and it's there. Uh, so take it seriously. Don't overdo it, but, but make sure you, you recognize those things. And culture in the sense of national culture or regional culture or generational culture as well. Um, when you get into it, don't reduce everything to some list of do's and don'ts and stereotypes. Um, so um, you asked me a couple of times do's and don'ts. I'm a little bit allergic to this do's and don'ts, but I try to twist them around to be more general things. Right. But don't expect uh, anything to be too specific because actually... The culture is a, uh, I call it a cocktail. It's it, it's a mixture of all sorts of things and it's it's very complex. And the last one is when you start thinking about diversity and inclusion, um, uh, realize that actually diversity is only one part of it. So actually, if you're applying for a job with a company and they say they're very diverse and you look at the people and they say, oh, this is a diverse group, you need to also think about um, how much the people feel they belong to that company. How feel, how do they feel included? Because I saw companies hiring very diverse people, but then the people left after a couple of years because they didn't really feel uh, welcome or belonging in the company. So yeah. it's not just diversity, it's diversity and inclusion and, and belonging. Yeah. So a couple of words uh, about the book I, I sure. have it here, so I can show it to you. It's called Bridge the Culture Gaps. And um, you should be able to get it in, in India, there's from Amazon India. Um, mm -hmm. they, they actually um, they do have it there. I, I checked, and you can get it as a um, as a paperback like this, of course. Yeah. But you can also get it as an ebook and as an audiobook. Um, I'm quite surprised, actually. I found the audiobook is doing very well in some countries. Uh, I, I didn't even uh, think about it when we when I agreed to write the book. There was going to be an audiobook, but. I hadn't realized, I, mean, I don't know, I'd be interested if uh, Generation Z, if, you, if you're into audiobooks, but I'm finding more and more people actually are, are doing that. Yeah. Um, so um, do get hold of it. Um, if you like it, write a little review on Amazon because that really is great for me. And the ebook is really very inexpensive, actually. I mean, it, it, for a time it was 99 euro a cents, you know, and now it's gone up to sensible price, but I don't know quite the price in India. But um, if you want a, a quick thing and it's handy, but the, I'm quite proud of the book because it's got some nice illustrations. So I would encourage you to get hold of that too. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you for the advertising slot. Um, <laughs> no, so lovely, uh, Robert. I, I really do want it to um, because uh, I think uh, we're really kind of uh, for the younger generation, they're connected at one level with technology and everything. But again, there could be this blind spot about, you know, because I watch an American sitcom or I watch that uh, English movie or whatever, I think I'm culturally savvy. And I think we Absolutely. just... Absolutely. Very yeah. deceptive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So we just need to be a little cautious there and really just, just you know, become better with uh, you know, listening to experts like you. So I, I'm happy. I think this has been one wonderful conversation where you've laid out a lot of good tips and I would going to encourage everybody to check out the book. Uh, simply because you've taken years of experience and amassed it into a simple book. I, I'm looking forward to checking it out. Thank you for yeah. um, kind of sending me that invite. So I'm going to check it out as well. And especially because I have two Gen Z boys you know, <laughs> and I tell them that, you know, hey, listen, don't, don't, don't think you're a cat whisker because the, uh, the world today is, is very different. And, you know, just when you kind of uh, overestimate uh, or have a higher perception of something, right, uh, you'll, you'll be uh, quickly... Uh, kind of shown the mirror, right? So I think it's it's good to hear and learn the basics, learn from an expert. So hope, hope people can check out um, the book, uh, your frameworks, and obviously this um, episode as well. So uh, Robert, once again, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed the conversation on a topic which uh, which was long overdue for my podcast, and I'm happy <laughs> that you were able to shed a lot of light. Uh, I look forward if your travels bring you to India to perhaps meet you in person. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And... So thank you very much for having me. And um, it's been very interesting talking to you. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, for all the all the problems and things, it's really a, a wonderful topic. And I I, I just enjoy every, uh, every intercultural encounter. And that's why I like traveling so much and uh, why I'm looking forward to my next trips. 
Um, so I would, I would final advice to you, everybody is to just enjoy those intercultural encounters. And yes. I found so often at business meetings, which can be very dry and some very technical topic. What do people talk about in the bar in the evening? They're talking about this cultural thing because it's, <laughs> it's really interesting and yes. fascinating. And I hope that I can infect you with that uh, enthusiasm for no, absolutely. Yeah. And at some point, maybe uh, if our travels cross, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, share uh, a coffee or a drink, maybe, maybe <laughs> okay. some more stories. I'd love, I'm sure you have so many more stories. So uh, looking forward to that. And thank you once again, Robert, uh, wishing you safe travels uh, over your next trip. Uh, and uh, I will um, talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. All the best. Thanks.